Hi, bookworms. Welcome to Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and my guest today is Don Davies. Dawn is the author of Mothers of Sparta, a memoir in pieces, published by Flatiron Books in 2018. Mothers of Sparta won the Florida Book Award Gold Medal for General Nonfiction and the GLCA New Writers Award for Creative Nonfiction. Her essays, short stories, and poems have been Pushcart Special Mentions and Best American Essay Notables. Her work can be found in McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, The Alaska Review, The Missouri Review, Poetry Northwest, Narrative, Fourth Genre, and in other journals and anthologies. She currently mentors creative writers and teaches self-paced and instructor-led workshops and writing classes at whistletreewriters.com. In episode two of this podcast, my friend Denise Masser joined me to talk about why Dawn's book, Mothers of Sparta, was the best book ever. Many of you wrote to me that you had picked up her book after listening to that episode, and I know how much you loved it too. What an incredible honor it is that someone whose book was the subject of this podcast joined me to discuss her own favorite book. If you haven't already, I encourage you to listen to the Mothers of Sparta episode to get a sense of how profoundly Dawn's insightful words affects her readers. I am absolutely thrilled that she agreed to join me today to talk about why she thinks The Water Method Man by John Irving is the best book ever. Bookworms, for only $5 a month, you can join my Patreon and get access to all kinds of goodness, including bonus clips with all of my guests, advanced access to the books we read, monthly book club menus, and more. Not only that, but for the entire month of September 2020, I'm sending a Best Book Ever face mask to all new patrons. And by the way, I get it. Masks are super annoying. They make you feel claustrophobic and itchy. But you and I have a whole lot of books to read, and if we get sick, we won't be able to talk about them. And talking about books is one of the great pleasures of life. So please, wear a mask. The one I'll send you when you become a patron is soft and light. I've been wearing my own for over a month now, and I really like it, as much as we can like anything pandemic-related. The good news is, if you wear a Best Book Ever logo over your face, men will stop telling you to smile and start asking you about your favorite book. That's a win for all of us bookworms with resting bitch face. To get yours, go to patreon.com slash bestbookever and sign up for only $5 a month. And as always, thank you for helping me keep the lights on over here in my reading cave. Now, back to the show. Hi, Don. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I love your podcast. I'm a fan. Thank you. And you were the first subject of our very first episode, which is so exciting to me. That's part of why I'm a fan, but that's not the only reason why I'm a fan. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I have to tell you, um, every once in a while, like, you know, writing's a lonely work and I'm home alone all day and I'm at this desk and uh, publishing's very strange right now. And there's a lot of uh, unknown futures for a lot of us. And um, it's easy to get down a little bit. And every time I think, oh, should I be doing this? I still have imposter syndrome, right? I've had like 50 publications and I still don't believe I I should be doing this sometimes. But um, every time I think, boy, this is really, this maybe isn't isn't what I should be doing. I'll just listen to that podcast. (laughs) I'm fine. (laughs) Very good. It must have been a wild experience to hear people discuss something that is so personal in your life you know, to publicly discuss it. Although I would imagine you get that a lot since you wrote a book that is so personal. Yeah, I did. And in the, okay, so here's the thing about writing memoir or writing, you know, your own story and telling what people think are intimate details. Um, As the writer, you control everything that goes out there. So I'm very much in control of what I want people to, to, to see and what I want people to think. And it sounds like Oh yeah, I guess I guess writers are control freaks. You know, we we decide the lens uh, that that people will look into. You know, um, and so everything I put out there, with the exception of Mothers of Sparta, the essay, which was extremely difficult and ethically um, kind of sketchy and difficult for me um, and our family, um, I 
was absolutely very aware of everything that I wrote about. And so people will come up to me and say, you know, I feel like I know you so well. I really know you. It's like, yeah, that's awesome. I'm so glad that was my intention. You really don't, you know, you don't know anything about me. The things uh -huh. that I really need, would need to protect in my life, I protect those and I don't, I don't write about them. So there's this thing as an author where you want to really share and you want to connect with the readers because that's my favorite thing of, of anything that I do is connecting with people and giving people an experience that's as powerful as the experience I get as a reader because I'm a reader. So that's mm -hmm. where it stems from. But um, um, I just, I'm protective of myself. I create a persona. So I'm a character and my, 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 the, the other people I choose to write about are also characters. And when you look at it in terms of that, you can be quite protective if you want to. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Do you, were you always a reader? Did you grow yes. up reading all the time? Yes. And this is part of what I love about your podcast is that you talk, you don't just talk about the books. Cause I mean, we can go to any literature <laughs> class that we want and talk about these, you know, Catcher on the Rye or Lolita or whatever. Uh, you talk about the, your guests relationships with reading and their relationships with the books, which I, I find fascinating overall. So mm -hmm. um, um, I love that you asked this because uh, that's interesting to me as a listener of your podcast to hear what people are saying about their relationships with the books that they read. I was always a reader. I remember, I actually, rem you know, I could be, this could be a fable that I've told myself, but I, I believe I remember learning to read. Mm -hmm. And I remember like a situation is one of my early memories and I was in a chair. I don't think it was a high chair, but it was super early. And I became very aware that the word Cheerios meant something. I would see the C and the H and the E and the, the O's and stuff. And that meant something to me. And I was trying to figure out what that was. And I think that was the beginning of me learning to uh -huh. read. And that was, that was young. My mom said I was young. I was trying to sort stuff out when I was probably two or three. And uh -huh. so I really remember books being a big part of my life since I have memory, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. My grandpa built me a little bookcase when I was, uh, I don't know, four or something like that. I still have it and I have books on it. So it's important. And what did you read when you were a kid? I read, um, here's what I remember reading. I remember reading Peter's mm -hmm. Chair. I remember reading Corduroy. Um, I remember reading, I guess, all the little books you would get in a library in the 1970s, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as I got older, it turned into series books. And so it was just great for my family because they could just give me the next book in a series for they never had to worry about Christmas presents or whatever yeah. for me. I just got the next book, you know. That was all, that was basically only what I really wanted was, you know, the next Trixie Belden book. Do you know Trixie oh, Belden? Oh, of course I yeah. do. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh, I loved her. They're on the shelf right there. Can you see? Oh, look at that. Yep. So, and, and then I did Nancy Drew. I didn't like it as much. I did the Hardy Boys. Um, I did all the British ones. I did the Five Little Peppers. I remember all the series books. And then I did all the Little House books. Uh -huh. And then that turned into Anne uh, Green Gables and everything that Ellen Montgomery um wrote I just followed all the way and then um you know Louisa May Alcott series I just would read everything that and so early on I decided that I really liked reading collections of an author and I know that um uh the Trixie Belden books were written by different authors under the Trixie Belden name what Carolyn Keene is that her mm -hmm. the author's yeah. name but it was different people but in general like Louisa May Alcott or even John Irving which is what we're going to talk who we're going to talk about today I would read them and I'd like to read from the beginning to the author's current work to see the evolution of the writing and the writing style and see if I can see themes that come through. Uh, and that's part of what I like about John Irving, which we'll talk about, is that um, he's got like a, like a fingerprint, things that he does that only he does. Oh. And I swear I could pick it out. If someone gave me a paragraph of his writing that wasn't published, I could pick it out of a lineup, you know? Yeah. So, what was the first John Irving you ever read? The first John Irving I ever read was probably Water Method Man. Oh, this really? That we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I read it. I may have read it in middle school uh -huh. <laughs> or early high school. And it was on my family's bookshelf. And so I remember just picking it up because I was also, the older I got, the I was indiscriminate as a reader. I read my mom's nursing textbooks. I read, um, my dad had some accounting textbooks. I just read them. I read everything there was. I, I had a library card and they just would let me loose there every week. And I would just come home with as many books as I could. Uh -huh. um, and so I just read the whole shelves. I read all the shelves in our house and this was on it and I, and I loved it. And probably about the time I was going into high school, I started, um, you know, 
developing like a an affinity towards certain types of writing. So I really liked John Irving because he was funny and he did uh -huh. quirky things that, you know, he didn't follow a straight narrative plot structure. It was, he made you figure stuff out while you were reading it. Um, there were things in his personality of, of that, that I later, much later learned was like a, the uh, implied author. John Irving is really good with the implied author and it's the version of the writer that the reader constructs when the reader is reading. And John Irving's really good at making readers think about that. And I, and I didn't know what that was, but I knew that I liked it. And so I found that in other authors. So I was reading like Richard Brodigan. I was reading Douglas Adams, all the Hitchhiker Guide books. Um, I was reading, um, who's the other guy I loved? Oh, James Harriet. I loved, mm -hmm. loved, loved James Harriet because he was funny and he wrote memoir pieces. Do you remember he wrote the, he was the veterinarian who wrote yeah, the, the All Things Great. All things, and, mm -hmm. wait, what's that called? All Things Wise and Wonderful. There. Yeah. And he, there was a four book series and they, they mm -hmm. would just were just magical to me, um, you know, partly because I think I was starting to study writing and didn't really understand that it was because I was just super interested in it. And partly because you can escape in a book, you can go somewhere else and completely, you know, live a different life. You said in your uh, text to me, this book shaped the writer you are. Yeah. The Water Method. Met. Can you tell us how? Yeah, sure. So let me be clear. It's not my favorite book because mm -hmm. I don't think I have a favorite book, but it's one of the books that I have gone and, and read and reread. Like I was saying, I didn't know I was studying writing when I was studying it. And I was just absorbing all the little things that, you know, I guess if I'd had a literature professor go over this text with me, I would have figured some of these things out in a different way. But because I was very ignorant and very like, organic about it and just experiencing these things, some of the things that he did are things that I find that I see in my writing sometimes. And I don't intend to do that. You know, like um, he always has to have a, an ending that gives hope. Not always, but he, you know, in some of the books that I love most about his, his endings give hope. And I do that. Like I like to have hope at the ending of stuff. Even an essay, I don't like an essay to end um, very bleakly, even if I'm writing about a bleak situation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that just a little emotional th thing that he does that that's a gift to the reader to give a little hope at the end of something. So there's mm -hmm. something. And then also he, um, he's very playful with, um, with character and memory. He's playful with names. I mean, if you think of some of the names in this, this book, we'll talk about them. Um, they're just fun and funny. So he can talk about these like ridiculous situations that are also totally plausible, but also totally ridiculous. And that is relatable because sometimes in life things are, things that are actually happening seem like they can't be happening. And I think he does that a lot in his, in his work. Uh, will you give a quick synopsis of the book for our listeners who may be, because this feels like an unknown or lesser known yeah. of his books. And I know like a, a lot of his, well, everybody knows Owen Meany, of course, yeah. but this one surprised me because I had never read it or even, yeah. I don't even know that I'd heard of it. Yeah. So it's a strange book. So, you know, I, I before this podcast, I, I went and looked up, uh, what other people would say about a synopsis because it's hard it's hard to summarize this book oh yeah it's a very strange book and um and i and i read like um like the new yorkers little review of it in 1972 or something it was written it was published in 72 so you have to keep in mind he wrote this in his 20s mm -hmm. um um and it's his second book his first one was setting free the bears which was published in 1968 i think and um so this was the second book published written before age 30 and published. And so the New York Times did a uh, synopsis of a little review of it. And it sounds nothing like what the book is. It sounds like a, a straight narrative of, of uh, Fred Trumper, a 20 something graduate student, um, has trouble with his, leaves his wife and, and then goes on to pursue and eventually get his PhD. It's like, that is not what this story is about at all, you know? No. So if I can briefly summarize it. So it's called The Water Method Man. And um, the, the, the main character who is, sometimes the narrator, because it's tricky, it's written in first person and third person, right? Um, he's, he is a 20-something graduate student um, in literature. He's in Iowa, and um, he's married with a child, and, and, and he and his wife get married because she gets pregnant while, when they first meet, very early on when they meet, and they get married. So there's a suggestion that they're ill-suited for each other, and that something won't go well, because they're very young, and they didn't know each other well. In a nutshell, if we're going to take the the, the the chronological thing. He marries a woman. He leaves her. He can't get his PhD done. He, he goes to New York. He meets another woman. He gets involved in like this underground film industry. And then he cracks up, leaves her, goes to Vienna, 
Austria, which is where he has um, history with his first wife and another guy uh, who is a dear friend of his who he has to reconnect with. And then he comes home. <laughs> yeah. That's also not what the story is about. I don't know what right. to say. It's really <laughs> hard. Um, there's a lot of, um, of commitment issues in this and he can't seem to ever finish anything. Like, well, he's obviously immature. He's not mature. But, and then we don't talk about why he can't finish anything. But the fact that he can't finish anything is paramount to every segment of the story. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> I mean, you're right that it can't be summarized because you didn't mention, I think, the central no. thing. Which, which what? Which is his penis doesn't work. Oh, correctly. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, that's huge. <laughs> that's a big thing. Well, yeah, his penis doesn't work. And it's another, yeah, oh, I forgot about that. Well, we've said the word penis. Now we can keep oh, saying okay. it on the podcast. Actually, the book opens up that way. And he can. Right. It's painful, and he has trouble urinating um, due to what we assume is like a, a stricture or some sort of congenital defect that he has, and he has a choice to get surgery, but he also stays noncommittal about that and chooses what's called the water method, which is to drink a lot of water before and after sex, and right. hopefully you would keep bacteria from congregating in there and stuff, and he chooses that, and that even itself is a, in, is a noncommittal move. Like he doesn't right. choose to fix anything. So um, weaving in and out of all of that is, is, is the fact that his penis doesn't really work right. Which is, and he's a guy in his 20s. The narrator's a guy in his 20s. We've got to keep in mind the author is a guy in his 20s. And so sex is going to figure prominently or at the thought of it or a preoccupation with it in some level, it's going to be in the story. About page 10. So I knew, you know, from page one, because he's at a doctor mm-hmm. trying to deal with his broken penis. So right around five, I started going, well, he talks about boobs a lot. Yes, he does. And so I took an orange highlighter. I don't know if you can see on here. And I started highlighting every time he mentions boobs, tits, cleavage, breasts, bras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are almost on every page, a little orange dot here where I marked it. And then I went back and I marked every time he talks about uses some word for penis. And again, went through almost every page. It's prick usually, right? It's prick. Prick, almost always. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just so fascinating to me that you didn't mention that in your synopsis, because to me, this was a book that was absolutely obsessed with the flesh, particularly Ah. the sexual organs. And the very last line is he, the flesh surrounding him, you know, the, all the good flesh around him. Yeah, isn't that funny? So I don't read it like that. Uh huh. Because I read, I, I'm, I guess I'm reading it every time I read it. I read it for, I guess I, here's what I do. I discount that in a way because I'm like, this is a guy in his 20s. He's going to be obsessed with this. And also, uh-huh. this is a guy who can't grow up. And when you can't grow up and you're infantile, you're going to want the booby, the boob, the breast, the, yeah. all that represents mother, closeness, um, comfort, all of that stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. So I kind of, and one of my readings kind of said, well, that's what this thing is about. And this to me represents, this penis stuff um, represents immaturity because mm-hmm. any sexual situation that, that actually, any sexual scene in the story is not in control. There's no control in that, in the sex, right? So, you know, he has a, an encounter with a graduate student, Lydia, Lydia Kindle, mm-hmm. remember? Um, I actually write about that in an essay. Um, men I would have mm. slept with, Lydia Kindle makes the essay. So, because oh. I, John Irving's on my list of men I would have slept with <laughs> in a funny way, right? Um, but uh, that's a failed sexual re- uh, encounter. He has um, the sexual encounter that he first has with Biggie, not mm-hmm. where he, either where he impregnates her or maybe not. We don't know if it's the first sexual encounter or not, but it's funny. They're very analytical about it. They're cold. Meryl, the uh, other character, is having a diabetic coma at the same time. So it's very strange. And they end up like taking him into their bed and warming him because he's freezing. And then the pee is stuck to the sheet. And and because it's so cold, there's no heat. So there's no there's no good sex, except for when he gets with his character, Tulpin. And the yeah. sex is good, but he doesn't talk about it. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of put it in the back as sex is a part of life for this character. And he's obsessed with the boo because he's the age he is and is an immature man. That is an interesting read yeah. because I didn't see every mention of boob as um, sexual. I saw his obsession with flesh as, yeah. and I did read, you know, he yeah. was, so was he 29 when he wrote it or published it maybe? I think, yeah. But I kept thinking, 
This is a young, virile author. He's known as being a wrestler. That's kind of a famous thing about John Irving, who is facing for the first time that our bodies, as you wrote yesterday, our bodies all eventually betray us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was all I could think through the whole thing is, oh, this is a guy who's never had to deal with the fact that he's going to fall apart. That's awesome. And, and, and when he goes to the doctor and he sees like the elderly patient at the, at the, mm-hmm. what's the doctor called who deals with uh, Jean-Claude Virignon or something like that, the French guy. <laughs> and he's, and he sees the elderly man in there getting treated for something. And he, yeah. he even describes him as yeah. um, tubes and wires inside yeah. flesh or something like he's falling apart in that waiting room. Yes. And mm-hmm. I just was so fascinated by his complete obsession with bodies and how they worked and their function and how they fall apart. Super interesting. I saw the whole thing is just him facing morale, mortality. Well, I'm going to be rereading it for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that does that. that and I love how different people get different takes on things. Yeah. Not, right? yeah. I thought this was absolutely vintage John Irving. And, it, mm-hmm. and it's been a long time since I've read a John Irving book. I laughed so hard while reading this because yeah. it was so perfectly him it was so absurd have you done the deep dive like you said you like to sort of be a completist with authors have you read all John Irving books no I haven't read all so I I he lost he he didn't lose me at Owen Meany but the magic for me disappeared my John Irving magic disappeared with Owen Meany because I didn't love Owen Meany really Um, and that's the one most people I know I know everybody loves Owen Meany I Mm -hmm. like I'm a garp I'm a Mm -hmm. garp person and uh water method I like his earlier stuff because you know I like to do weird stuff with it. And these early books do weird stuff. Like Garp is a strange book too. There's a, you know, the pension girl parser and all that weird fiction within the book that I wouldn't have put in if I were his editor, but that's okay. It's Garp. It's, it did mm-hmm. fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, it, I like the taking chances. I like the epistolary. I like the weird angles. I like the point of view switches and stuff like that. And he got more narrative and he got really good with his craft. He's incredible and I love him. But it, the magic was gone for me after Owen Nini. So I've read a couple of things. Like he did um, In One Person, uh, well, which actually won a Lambda Literary Award in what, 2013 for uh, a bisexual character. So he's, mm. he's wonderful. But um, I have not read all of his stuff and I feel like I need to and I probably will. Now that we've mentioned it, I'll probably just go do it. When I was reading a little bit about him, I found this article in The Guardian and I found this great quote that I wanted to share with you. For a two-fisted author who makes Macho Hemingway look like a whining bench warmer. <laughs> uh-huh. Irving's been widely praised for his sensitive handling of such subjects as abortion and sexual identity. Forty years ago, the most sympathetic, least intemperate character in the world, according to Garp, was a transgender character. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Oh, yeah, that's Roberta Muldoon, which is a fantastic character and also played really well in the movie, if you've seen the movie by uh, John Lithgow. So good. Um, People criticize John Irving for having one-sided female characters who are stereotypical. Um, But you got to keep in mind, this is like a, this is a dude's dude. He's two-fisted dude. You see that quote said two-fisted, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And he basically writes for guys about guy issues, you know? And I don't mind reading about that. I read, I like reading it. It's fine. Um, The duplicitous nature of being a man, of being sensitive and also you know, lusting, you know, um, right. being um, devoted to your family, but also wanting something else. I mean, there's, there's a lot of that in a lot of his stories that I've read. Yeah, maybe, so maybe he was 32 when he wrote Garp, say, I'm guessing. He was early 30s when he wrote Garp at a time when um, there weren't a lot of transgender like, studies and there, were no, there was no knowledge for regular people to just get information. He wrote very beautifully about this um, mm-hmm. when he was a young heterosexual dude and mm-hmm. he gave it... Um, worth you know it was it was a beautiful character so i think he was doing stuff for women um and and feminism i'm sure there's all kinds of feminist theory and critique about him out there but you know if you think of his female characters like um like um jenny fields garp's mom Mm -hmm. she asexual wants a baby does not want a man Mm -hmm. she gets a baby raises her baby without a man super practical and then becomes this feminist icon right um cider house rules the woman's right to choose. Um, even if you look at Water Method Man, which is when he was in his 20s writing immaturely, um, Tulpin, the, char- the girlfriend character, doesn't take any crap from him. She, mm-hmm. She's like, you go do your thing. I don't need you. Um, Biggie, his wife, whom he abandons with their child, um, 
moves on quite well. And even you see very early in the story, she's saying stuff like, you know, you were never good at that. I'm going to fix the front porch. You can't do those types of things. She mm -hmm. biggie earned the money, you mm -hmm. know, so there, there are feminist characters. And, and, and even if they're like a little nebulous and kind of people call it stereotypical, but I feel like it's just because he doesn't connect in a way and he writes the way he can about it. Let's talk a little bit about the names. Uh -huh. Fred okay. Trumper. <laughs> yeah, Trumper. So his name is Fred Trumper, but everyone in his life calls him something different. So there's there's a there's a an idea right there that 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 he's not seeing himself as a whole person, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we've got his uh, his girlfriend calls him Trumper by his last name. His wife calls him Bogus, <laughs> um, which you know. Very early on, we got to talk about unreliability in the narration in a minute too, but very early on, he sets himself off as an unreliable person. And it's very easy for the reader to see this, but he says, I'm not so honest. I'm pretty good liar. In fact, people who've really known me tend to believe in me less and less, right? He says mm -hmm. it the, out of the gate. So um, Bogus is one of his names. Um, Ralph, um, one of his friends from grad school calls him Thump Thump, you know, <laughs> but also the other names are, are, are strange in the, in the thing. If you think Tulpen. That's not an American name. It means tul tulip in German, which is beautiful. Kuth is his friend. And what you think is Kuth, not uncouth. He's Kuth, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. He has, he, he's the one who ends up, I can't say, I don't want to spoiler alert it, but he <laughs> remains, he shows his Kuth throughout the story, right? Um, his wife is Biggie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't think it's because she's fat. There's no indication that there's any body shaming or anything. She's big. She's solid. She's got muscular legs, a muscular butt. She's thick, you know? Um, and then Calm is the son. If you think of that, Calm is like calm, right? Mm -hmm. And then Lydia Kindle, the, the, the little girl who he, the little undergraduate he almost has an affair with. Kindle, think about the idea of kindling a desire or kindling something. You know, everyone, even the, like, um, even the, his thesis advisor, Holster, right? Mm -hmm. So every name has a, has a playful double entendre, I think. Yeah. What do you think about all the, um, all the different, was it, was it hard to read thinking, hearing all the different names and keeping it Initial, straight? Initially, I thought, how, how many, what's happening here? Are there yeah. 15 main characters? Who's this yeah. bogus guy? And then as soon yeah. as I figured out that we are all calling him something different, I yeah. love that. And bogus, of course, made me laugh every single time it came up. Yeah. yeah. No, it's so, funny. It's a great name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, yeah, it encapsulates a lot of what he stood for early on because he was lying. He was lying to his wife. He was lying. He was bumbling through life. I think about that. You know, I'm telling you, you know, the books that we read early on are the ones that leave a mark in our brains. I, and I tell you, I think about that, that ballad that he's trying to, with no interest, trying to like pointlessly um, translate to get his PhD. I think about that every week because to me that was so satirical and absurd um, that it's just, that's one of the funniest parts of the book is, is the storyline of Actel and Gunnel. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. you know? But it's strange. Like what is this storyline embedded in this other storyline, which is also embedded in this third storyline? Where do we start and what does it all mean? Which clearly influenced you where you embedded the story of how Spartans, mothers of Sparta, raise their children, you, you, and you embedded another story into your narrative. I can see very clearly. How oh, yeah. I think I, I wasn't thinking of it. That was kind of just, I was just kind of braiding that. I wasn't thinking, but maybe John Irving is braiding in fiction. So uh, braiding a narrative in nonfiction is kind of a, kind of a thing. Like, yeah, it's popular. We, you know, we, we do it and, and it, if it's done right, it's nice. If it's not done right, it's forced. And, you know, um, and if it's done with too many braid, strands it's like scrolling on instagram it's not successful but um but um i mean you can trust it as much as you're willing to trust that somebody you know your unreliable narrator has fallibilities right so you still want to trust that what they're saying even if it's not the truth it's their truth and that's what we buy into right mm -hmm. so the nice thing about um an unreliable narrator so he could have just he could have just Holden Caulfield this. He could have just um, catch her on the ride this thing and done a straight thing with uh, first person narration all the way through, but he didn't. He mm -hmm. complicated it by three or four layers. Um, but the nice thing about, the fun thing about Unreliable Narrator for me is it takes a, it takes a triangular relationship between the narrator, the writer, the author, and the reader. And in the case of Unreliable Narrator, uh, narrator the, um, the narrator is left out of the, the triangle and there's a relationship between the author and the reader that happens that I am fascinated with. Yeah, it's, it's quite a feat. It's also strange, you know, he's 
he's got so many balls in the air at the same time that that uh it's it's fun so tell me what are you reading right now what am i reading now um uh, right now i'm actually reading so can i tell you what i read all summer yes okay so i was locked down all summer and as was everybody it's mm-hmm. not special um but i decided you know i have a lot of books that's just one shelf i have a lot and i've read most of them so i kind of but I, there were a couple I didn't read because they were really big. So I'm talking like thousand pages. So I've read like f- only four books or so this summer, but I read really the biggest books I could possibly find. Uh-huh. So I read About Face by um, Colonel David Hackworth. It's a big, big, big book. And it's a his story about being a soldier. And he's like, he buys into the whole soldier thing. It's a memoir. Um, and he's a very good soldier for a couple of wars until he gets to Vietnam and then he changes his tune about what that war is all about and what war is and how the army works and stuff is fascinating. Um, but as a big book, I read gone with the wind, um, because I hadn't read it since I was like 15 or 16 and I needed to, to, to you know, to see, um, mm-hmm. that was a big book. And then I read, what did I read? Uh, Gates of fire by Stephen Pressfield. I kind of had a war thing. There was a lot of, I think everything I read yeah. was war this, this summer. Stephen, Gates of fire is about, um, do you know that story? That's about that's no. a the, that's about um, the Battle of Thermopylae and, and the the Spartans and okay. it's a really big book. I like that part of history. I don't know why. And so the other thing that I was that I did when I when I stopped that was I started up with my um, my favorite hobby, which is um, autopathography and stories of um, like medical stories, medical memoir. Um, that's that's kind of my jam for the last two years. I've been very into it. And so the what I'm reading right now. The long roundabout answer to this question is uh, Lying by Lauren Slater. Do you know Lauren Slater? No. It's a really good book. Um, So she writes about um, mental illness. I think she's a therapist. Um, I came across her in an anthology by Lee Gutkind um, called, I think it's called Surviving Crisis or something like that, where writers are writing on you know, uh, the toughest things in their lives. And I came upon an essay about when she was in a mental institution and uh, she's also a therapist. So I got it yesterday in the mail and then I took a walk and I read, I read while I walk. Um, I How read do you books do that? I don't know. I, ha- I live in a flat place. It's very flat and I know all the, the, the sidewalks are really good and, and I haven't fallen. Um, <laughs> but I, I've done that since I was a kid. I, I, I know it's crazy, but I, I think I read, I walked five miles and read 90 pages. I was so interested in this book. So that's my latest project, uh, latest reading uh, project. And I'm going to read it, reread it as soon as I'm done. It's really good. What is your attraction to, what did you call it? Autopathography. Autopathography. What's your attraction to that? So, um, you know, well, I've had a, I have autoimmune disease. It's kind of a, like an unfortunate fact that no matter what I do, it's never going to go away. I don't think I'm going to cure myself of it just because I'm, you know, taking saunas or seeing the best doctors or, or fasting two days a week or, or taking the right form of magnesium or whatever, you know, um, there, it's never going to go away. I have this thing. And, um, and when, as soon as I think I've beaten it, it comes back and smacks me in the face again. And, it's been happening for some years. I actually, the last essay in my mother's Asparta book is about having Sjogren's syndrome, which is one of my autoimmune diseases. And, um, and there's something about telling that story that it's not a woe is, woe am I, woe is me story. It's a, it's a, if I tell the story, then I take the power back from the medical chart. And Mm -hmm. if I read a story that someone writes about this, I contribute to the writers taking back their power from their medical chart. So, so often we're like, I feel like we're like colonized by doctors. If you're a patient, you are completely colonized. You're told what to think, what to take, what to eat, where to go, when to do it. And then all the information about you is stored in a place that you can't really access. If you think about it, right? You have this chart and it becomes a representation of you, like a persona of you. That's not you. And um, I started writing the four animals essay that I wrote and that was published in Mothers of Sparta was my first essay writing about it. And I felt very embarrassed about it at the beginning. Like, oh, everyone's gonna think, poor me, it's super melodramatic. It's 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 sentimental or whatever. And it's really not. It's it's really powerful to write it. And um and I think that it's healthy for everybody who is telling their stories of whatever illness, mental illness, trauma writing. You know, there's a lot of military writing that's happening. Um, that's always happened since we've had wars. People have written about them, but that's mm-hmm. healing to write about it. And it's healing like on a, a social and cultural level to read other people's stories and to be their witnesses. So that's what I'm into right now. That is my 
ultimate jam right now. I'm reading everything I can on it because I'm writing it. And this is exactly what I was talking about when I said that I see that influence of Irving in your writing, because that thing that he does where he puts a story within a story and I think that's really the point of it, right? That's the point of writing is we're going to these stories and sometimes we reach back to other stories. And usually, like, for example, in Water Method Man, the low, old low Norse, <laughs> you're tempted to sort of skip through it, but the author is saying, no, there's something I want you to pay attention to mm-hmm. here. That's what I got out of Mothers of Sparta when you... Oh, wow. It's initially easy to go, oh, yeah, so the Spartans live this way. I want to get back to Dawn's story. but the technique is very important, isn't it? Because it's saying, I got something from someone else's story. Mm-hmm. I, oh, wow, yeah. And this, this is why the story is important. And that's that's what I see in Irving is he's telling me, this is the, this is the story. This is how we connect by bringing it into another story. And that's what I see in your writing. And, and all good memoir, right, mm-hmm. is when it says, this is the point. And sometimes mm-hmm. I'm going to make the point by giving you my interpretation of someone else's story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really nicely said. Yeah, it's all about, well, it's all about the story. Mm-hmm. We all want stories. You know, if you, you know, you see an ambulance and you're driving home from work or whatever, and you want to like, what happened? We want right. the story. We live for stories. Every area of our lives, we want to know what happened. You know, in fiction, we want to escape, but in, in memoir and stuff, we want to know the truth. What is the story? And the, the art of memoir is the ability to tell the story in different ways, just like a painter, different painters paint using different medium, you know, media and, and different colors and different styles and techniques and stuff. So there's so, and that, that's why memoir fascinates me is there's so many different ways to tell the story. You don't just have to tell the chronological narrative of the story. You can be as rich as you want to. You can bring in all yeah. the little things, you know. Do you read mostly memoir or mostly nonfiction? No, I okay. no, I don't. I go through I go through phases, um, and I know that when I'm writing, so I'm always usually always writing something. There's sometimes when I don't write when I'm just really thinking hard, and I think that I'm still writing when I do that because mm-hmm. I'm trying to puzzle something out. And so actually, like I, I didn't write it all this summer. I I didn't write anything, but I'm still writing because I'm thinking about this project that I'm reading a lot, you know. Um, but when I'm really writing and I'm involved in in a project intensely I don't read anything I only read my own work Mm -hmm. which sounds weird but I think I don't want to be distracted I don't want to sound like anyone else I don't want to second guess something I'm doing you know and then when I'm kind of lightly in a project I read whatever that project isn't so I just finished a novel and I didn't read any fiction for that year Mm-hmm. I just read mem- I just read nonfiction. It's not just memoir. I read personal essays. I like I like biographies. I like history. I read a lot of history, and I try to read what I'm not currently doing because I don't want to be influenced by it. Can you? Are you able to share what you're working on right now, or is that top secret? Yeah, no, it's not top secret. I don't talk a lot about it because I think it takes energy away from it. I, in general, it's a story of. It's the story. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. It's a real weird memoir that relates to um, how our bodies um, as adults handle um, our experiences in childhood. So there's a lot of emotional stuff, there's memory, and then there's physical stuff too, because I really think that autoimmune disease has a lot to do with um, emotional components of stuff that you weren't able to process, say, in childhood or traumatic events or something like that. There's a word for that, right? Epigenetics. Yep. So I'm reading some epigenetic stuff right now. Um, There's a book called It Didn't Start With You which is fantastic. So it's about generational trauma, although trauma is not my favorite word. Generational experiences and stuff that we do didn't start with us. It could be two generations ahead of us. So um, that, you know, if your grandmother was in the war, a war, Mm -hmm. then you have that in you because the mother had it and it goes two generations. What are you, what are you reading? What am I reading right now? I am rereading the Hearts Invisible Furies by John. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm working on something that um, is not like that, but is a is a um, structured like a big multi generational family tale. Because like like all good writing, he makes it feel very easy. Yeah. yeah. To do. Yeah, and that's a, that's easy. a trick right there. Yeah, it's like watching yeah. like a professional basketball player do a layup. I can do that. He just yeah, tossed sure. it in the basket. How you hard know? could it possibly How be? How could that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wish. Don, this has been so fascinating and so wonderful to talk to you. Will you tell our listeners where they can find you? 
Yep, you can find me. I have a Facebook account, uh, Don Davies Books. I have an author page, Author Don Davies, I think it's called. And that sounds so pretentious, but it's not. It's just to differentiate me from like sommelier Don Davies who's out there. And there's an anthropology Don Davies who's out there doing stuff. And there's a like a, a philanthropist Don Davies, and that's not me. So I have author <laughs> Don Davies, just so you know which one you're getting. Um, right. <laughs> um, I am on Instagram at Don Landia. Uh, D-A-W-N-L-A-N-D-I-A. And then uh, my website is uh, dawndaviesbooks.com. What kind of courses do you teach? Well, I'm starting actually teaching for the first time online courses for any adult writer who wants to sign up. So I'm actually teaching a eight-week workshop on autopathography. And I'm starting a I'm like an intensive mentorship for five students at a time or six month mentorship for um, the first one we're doing is called writing motherhood, which is mothers who are writing memoir about family. Wow. So I'm doing those two this semester and then we'll see each semester. I want to offer different things. Is this through a university or something or this? No, is just it's, something it's, it's, it's through me. It's something I'm starting to do because I really believe that. Um, and I, I try to make it very accessible for people and affordable and easy, um, uh-huh. easy to do. Um, because I feel like, um, you know, we're all isolated, but it's important to still keep writing. What a and great pre- idea. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I'm a little nervous. Thanks for listening, book nerds. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, please go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com, or follow the podcast on Instagram at bestbookever. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie Wrote a Book. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it on social media and leave a review on whatever podcatcher you use. Reviews really help our visibility to new listeners, and we are grateful for everyone. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.